every now and then we run across uh, an opportunity to talk to somebody extraordinarily special. His career has, has been a, a wonder and he's left a, a real imprint uh, on the industry. His name is John Crennan and he joins us on the Informer. John, welcome to the program and more importantly, congratulations on what has been a fantastic career. It, it started with General Motors Holden way back in 1962 when I was a, a young pup. Um, it was an extraordinary time, a time to challenge the world. And Holden was doing something so many people didn't think it was possible doing. It was competing with the very best in the world. Yep, no, that, that um, it was a, a great start, 62, whilst it was December 1962, I finished school on the Friday and started work on the Monday in the mailing room because my sales cadetship, my sales cadetship wasn't due to come through until the 1st of April and the employment officer said, Would you, oh, we've got a vacancy in the mailing room if you want to start early. I said, count me and I'll be there. And I've got to tell you that three and a half months in the mail room was probably the, the, the best education anybody could ever get in a, big, in a big company. And I don't regret it for one minute. I'm very proud of my, of my mail room background. But, you know, to be able to step into, into General Motors, even in that lowly position and just see the infrastructure and, and, the, and the whole relativity of Holden and the pride and the loyalty of everybody in the place was, was an enormous buzz. Uh, John Crennan, uh, what did you learn in the mail room in those very early days that it, that's, that's held you in such good stead? Well, the, the very first thing, and it was a sort of an unconscious learning, is that there were seven other mail room boys. And, you know, you, you covered the massive area of General Motors and there had to be three mail runs, three pickups and three deliveries every day. And so the first thing I noticed is there were seven other guys with exactly the same job. And, and perhaps it's the competitive spirit in one, et cetera. And the first thing I had to do was beat them. I, I wanted my boss to see that I was a better operator at delivering the mail, picking up the mail, and perhaps engaging with the, the 100 secretary. Everybody in those days, every boss had a secretary. So first and foremost, I learned... You know, if I'm going to get anywhere, I've got to beat. I've got to beat the guy that's got the, the same job. So I think that was my that was my very first learning. The, the, the second part of it was is that um, uh, I, I've never forgotten because, particularly in the administrative area, you know, where there's probably about 50 bosses, and I, I, I learned a, a lot about how boss bosses behaviour. Um, just, just you know, purely by noticing them, I'd walk into the secretary's office. It was alongside the the, the big boss's office, and, and I found they were either warm and friendly and decent, and you know, treated the male boy with with some degree of of, of decency, or they were completely up themselves, snobs, fakes, etc. And I determined that if ever I was going to be a boss, first and foremost, no one would ever call me Mister because there was plenty, everything was a mister around there. Um, no one had ever called me a mister. And, and secondly, I, I certainly didn't ever want to be up myself. I wanted to, I wanted to be, uh, you know, somebody that, that people could relate to, no matter the cleaner right up to the, you know, right up to the, to the boss. So, um, and the third thing is I learned so much about General Motors. I knew every single department. The mail boy got to go to all the security areas in design, in en experimental engineering, et cetera. So you saw what, saw what was happening. And, and I, had a, I had a better three months education than most university graduates that started off in sales department or finance department or engineering department because I, I had my arms around the entire organisation, knew everybody, every boss, every secretary, et cetera. So I could still rattle off their names today. That's a fantastic um, uh, bit of advice and it tells you so much about your character because it, it says to me that you had the, uh, the, the, the nourishment from your parents and the support that they'd given you where you could stand and look and assess character, uh, good, bad and different and decided you were going to follow your path. Um, who was the mentor yeah. for you? Who was, what was, who was the person that gave you that break that allowed you to move from the mail room and go to the next level? Well, probably my father. My father started at General Motors. The first year General Motors came to Australia in, 19, in 1926. 
Um, and he certainly helped me get the job somewhat because the employment officer was a, a very good friend of Dad's. But he was in the he was in the um, in the purchasing department and sourcing overseas plant and equipment. And Dad said to me, "Son, because you're a bit of a yapper, <laughs> you, you, you you really should be in the sales department. The, the, the sales department of General Motors is the lolly shop. That's where they get you know when you when you move on a bit, you get a company car, you get expense accounts, you get to go to parties." You get to go and have it. you have all the fun so he said for god's sake you've got to get into the sales department that's that's for you so he probably set me on the on the right train in terms of getting me into the sales department but then a, a year into being in the sales department as a very humble young 18 year old uh, sales cadet there was a gentleman by the name of john bagshaw who was the general sales manager and that guy to this day um i i, I spoke at his uh, celebration of his life in the Gold Coast in 2012 and I wrote an article yesterday for a magazine that asked me to do a story on, on the Holden 51 years in motorsport and I credited John Bagshaw uh, very much with being the, 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 the captain coach of the team of the century of Holden's motorsport and, and, and just a charismatic figure that sort of lit up a room the second he walked in, had his arms across everything, was engaging, was warm, was friendly. He was tough because the car business, um, as your father would tell you, um, it, it wasn't for the faint of heart. She, 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 she was a big boy's game, and and you, you you didn't get there by being a nice guy all the way. You know, you had you had to know how to you know deliver a short a short half cross every now and then where it was needed. So, yeah, John Bagshaw was probably career-wise my my mentor. And what was that step that said to you, sales fitted you like a glove? Now, Bagshaw was a tremendous role model and mentor that you shaped yourself around. But when did you start feeling the confidence that you had the necessary tools in your kit that would allow you to take the next step, not only for yourself, but also for Holden? Yeah, well, I think the first job I had in, in sales was I had to record all the sales of every dealer in Queensland. And there was another sales cadet, did the one for New South Wales, the one for Victoria, etc. So I got to know every single dealership in, in, in every part of Queensland. There were probably 100, 120 dealerships up there in that. And, and you, you used to have to record the General Motors sales, the Ford sales, the BMC sales, all, all the car sales, etc. And, and so... Uh, and, and the, the sales, they'd have sales competitions for all the area managers and district managers. And everybody said to me, including John Bagshaw, he said, you don't get anywhere in General Motors unless you've been in the field. You, you've, got to, you've got to go and be a district manager. And they, the, the, the common term is normally a sales rep, um, but they call them district managers. So all I did was just put my head down and want to, and want to be a, a district manager. And uh, I got that at 23 years of age. I was one of the younger people to get out into the field. And they, I was assigned the, I was assigned the Wimra the Wimmera district and had the best, one of the best years of my life and then was promoted to Gippsland, which was a bigger, a bigger area and then brought into the metropolitan area. And, and I just felt very comfortable in the, in the sales mode. Um, you know, to me, uh, I think I, I noted earlier that, that, that to me, the, the, the day we moved from, from sales into, into the, the world of marketing, uh, the, the world lost a lot because you know I, I'm not one for trying to do business on a on a computer or a or a or, or a PowerPoint presentation. Give me the ability to go and talk to somebody eyeball to eyeball and get a deal done. That to me is the the way it works, and that's what I was really taught. Well, that hands-on experience that you've just talked about would have fitted in beautifully when you met your next challenge. Because uh, for me, you don't become the, the man that everyone acknowledges as the founder of the Holden Special, Serv uh, Special Vehicles, the, HS the HSV, uh, if you don't have something special about you. They were extraordinary vehicles, they were extraordinarily competitive times. You had some terrific drivers against other terrific drivers and it was a, a, a tremendously uh, exciting time in motorsport in this country and you were right on the edge and then right in the middle of it. Yeah, um, it, 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 it was and look, um, we had a big leg up because we took over from the Peter Brock organisation. Um, as you probably recall back in, in 1987, Peter got involved in a, an energy polariser program. And the the ionizer. 
yeah, ultimately led to him being fired by General Motors, etc. So the dealers were enjoying the specialty vehicle aspect of that because it was you know, a, a nice added bonus in their, in their sales, etc. And it was an enthusiast car. So um, that, that business we put out to tender when I was marketing manager at General Motors, and, and a guy by the name of Tom Walkinshaw won the tender. He was doing similar Jaguar work over there. And, and they were struggling getting, he, he particularly wanted to have an Australian guy run that business because he thought that the, the, the someone taking over from Peter Brock um, had to be, you know, that didn't want to be look like it was a pommy guy that, that sort of was running the business from the other side of the world with poms around it everywhere. So, um, um, when, the, when they sort of were struggling to appoint a, a CEO, um, and we, we were having a planning meeting. It was getting pretty close to them opening. He asked me if I'd join, and, and it was the right timing. I, I was 42 years of age, I think, and just sort of saying, well, what do I do with my career next? You know, do I want to be a General Motors for the rest of my life? So that was the, that was the lucky break. And, yes, certainly um, the, the, the chance to be able to run a car company there and a, and a motor racing company there where they're joined at the hip, was a terrific experience um and and certainly in the note i wrote yesterday i said that while i was at hsv i think we sold about fifty-five thousand cars in that in that 20 years in a, in this very classic niche we're in uh, and i dare say half of those came as a consequence of, of how we leveraged the racing operation and, and the passion and the drive and the enthusiast aspect of, of people were there so you know we used our drivers to great to great effect um, and and that, that did drive, you know, there was certainly, we did prove in those days that, that win on Sunday, sell on Monday was, was a very real, a very real thing. You had some terrific drivers that uh, became part of, of the uh, uh, motor uh, folklore in this country. Who were the people yep. that uh, you enjoyed working with the most? Oh, that, yeah, in, in terms of enjoyment, that's interesting. <laughs> um, my, my boss, Tom Walkinshaw, said to me, once, he said, John, don't get emotionally attached to drivers because <laughs> one, 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 day, one day you hire them and there'll be a day, one year, two years, three years, you'll fire them. You know, they'll have, they'll have. So um, I did get myself emotionally attached to a guy by the name of Thomas Mazira, a um, guy born in Czechoslovakia, escaped the escaped the, the, the communist regime and came to Australia. And uh, to this day, I still rate Thomas as, as the finest gentleman I've ever met in the car business, uh, particularly, a, particularly a driver. Um, uh, had very, very close dealings with Peter Brock. And unfortunately, I was the central figure in him being fired and had to deliver the letter to him that, that, that finished him. But I, I was rather delighted you know, four or five years later to be able to offer him a factory drive and bring him back into the factory after he'd been shut out in the cold for so long. He well and truly, so I was trying to get him two years earlier, but General Motors wouldn't have that. But Peter's, Peter's popularity didn't wane one little bit. It was a David and Goliath battle. And, and, uh, and, and, and he won that in, in the, in the public image stake. So he, he was, but he was very interesting to work with. I mean, you could, you could say to Peter, one day, Peter, we've, ju we've just done a deal with Coca-Cola, um, and uh, you know we've got to be very conscious of that that deal that we've got with Coke. And, and, the, and the next day, I'd read something that Peter's done a deal with Pepsi. <laughs> 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 I mean, that's 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 going to a, a, a rather extreme example of Peter's unpredictability. But uh, he was there was never a dull moment with Peter. Craig Lowndes, of course, came along. We signed Craig Lowndes up. And, and in his first full year, won the championship, and he sort of was seen as the, the heir apparent to Peter Brock. And then certainly, uh, I then worked behind the scenes to to get Mark Scaife into the team, because um, you know, I'm not being unfair here, just in the same way as if I was sat in a racing car, I wouldn't have a clue what to do. And quite often, racing car drivers in a business environment don't quite have a clue what to do, but you can't tell them that. But Mark Scaife was a bit different to other racing car drivers. He really enjoyed the big end of town, understood the big end of town, understood the commercial realities of, of so much of the, the workings of the business. So he, he had a great 
a business brain as well as obviously a great capability. So yeah, that, that, those four guys really are, are the ones that were, were, were the highlight people and, and the ones that, uh, that you sort of had, had a lot to do with. I, I've noticed uh, in my journey, uh, the motorsport industry has had some outstanding characters who have helped it grow and grow and grow. I remember when the, the Grand Prix left Adelaide, uh, Clipsal came along and said, we need an event. And it was the supercars that came on board. But it, it required the drivers to understand they were no longer the, the, the guys that were setting up the race. They were going to be the, the key stars. And it was the way they spoke to the cameras, the way they spoke to their audience, and the way that they supported their sponsors that uh, elevated that one-time uh, sideline race or, or a curtain raiser to become the main act. For us, it's always been Bathurst. What was it for you? Did you understand uh, the role that the drivers had and the teams behind them? Yeah, look, uh, as I've said to many people, um, the, the thing about the sport when I got, I mean, initially I was, when I was made merchandising manager at General Motors in 79, John Bagshaw was posted to America to a very big job and the motorsport portfolio came under my jurisdiction and it was about a, a five or $6 million budget that we had to do. But but I sat on the, and I enjoyed the administrative side. And as I said, because I wasn't a, a, a technical person, I restricted my my efforts to, to the administration and the and, and the, I'd liken it more to and even when I was running H I'd liken it more to the president of a football club where where you've got to have a pretty good understanding of the sport but you've got to have a damn good understanding of, of the business and and I um, I've so often said that that in the car in the motor racing business if you went to Bathurst or you went to a car race meeting I guarantee that that. 95% of the people employed in that industry had their head under the bonnet trying to make the car go faster in one way, shape or form. Mm. While they were doing that, because I always said, if you saw me with looking under the bonnet, I'm being a fake because <laughs> I wouldn't have a clue wouldn't have a clue what I should be doing, unlike your father, who would have would have loved every, every moment of that. But while that was happening, I was walking around the track working out how I could possibly commercialize our involvement, how I could monetize our involvement, how I could find more funding for the team, because in, in motorsport, there is no substitute for cubic dollars. And probably the, 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 the biggest thrill I had is in, in 1990, when we first went up to Bathurst, I said to my PA, who was with me, she was my secretary at at Holden and then she came and joined us and was 27 years. And Marg, I, I asked Mark to let, uh, put up a, a, um, a trestle table and let's sell a few t shirts and t-shirts. And I think we spent about five grand on that. And, you know, thought, you know, how do we go with that? We'll probably end up coming back with an et cetera. Put it out on the th Thursday afternoon. Everything was sold by six o'clock that night. And that was the forerunner to a merchandising business that I got accused by General Motors sometimes of being more interested in than the car business because it, it was such a growth thing. And, and I got as much enjoyment as selling a, a $20 T-shirt or a $15 cap to a teenage kid as I did a, a, a Holden Senate at $75,000 to a company executive. And, and, and we built that business to the point that we were selling $15 million worth of apparel a year. And, and my understanding, well, a guy by the name of Craig Kelly, who's closely involved with marketing in, in, in the sports marketing side, at that time, it was probably that we were outselling, we were outselling the, any AFL football club, we were outselling uh, Australian cricket in, in terms of merchandising. But that, 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 was a, that was a real thrill. So, yes, my, my, my interest really lay more in how can I, even if, even if we had... Craig Lowndes hamburgers. I wonder how that would go. You know, I, I was always wanting to be able to, be able to find a way, and we, we started club memberships and things like that. Uh, John Crennan is our special guest on The Informer, uh, and we're going to do a two-part series with him. We're just doing a bit of a background, finding out what made John Crennan tick and what, and what drove him to become this, uh, this godfather of uh, HSV. And it was a tremendous time. But you know what you're telling me? What you're telling me is what all the great sporting organisations and franchises have been doing for the last 20, 30 years, and that is bringing their, 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 that merchandising expertise and making sure that for their client or for their fan, 
they got the best possible outcome. And you seem to be doing it way ahead before anyone else was thinking about it. Yeah, you know, and I think that was part of my sales side of things. You know, I, I, there were so many people in motorsport that did it for the fun of it. And when I say the fun of it, they wanted to win, but they, they, they didn't worry about the, the P&L statement or the balance sheet. And, 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 and because I was running the business for a, a, a guy overseas, I think I was more cautious with his money than I would have been on my own. So there was no way known I was going to allow our racing team to, to run at a loss. So, you know, I was very conscious of my job being, I mean, I also did all the negotiations with the drivers and those sorts of things, but I did not get involved in the racing operations. And it's a bit like football and that, you know, I don't think a good administrator should in, should tangle with the coach and, and tell the coach how to run the players, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, that, that, was, a, that was a good balance. I hope people are listening because... I can remember a time when I was a president of a football club and I remember people saying to me, why don't you tell the coach this? We want that boy to play. And I'd say to them, I've told the coach that we don't talk to him until the end of the season when we get to assess his performance and decide whether we'll keep him. I don't interfere. Correct. I'm not the coach. That's why we employed him and I'm the president of the club. And what you were doing, you were the brand king. You were, you were making sure that your branding resonated not only yeah. on, the, on the track, but throughout the track, throughout the series, wherever the races were going, the, I can remember G, uh, GMH, HSV, Holden, those brands resonated. It, it also helps that I lived in the eastern suburbs, uh, Pagewood and the plant was just down the road um, and we felt it, we knew the cars and of course being in the motor game through my father, we, we drove Holdens as well. So we had just about every other model, uh, yeah. probably the year after they were released. Dad would always make sure it was the second version or the third version of, the, of, that, of that model rather than the first one, which might have a few little things not quite right. Not that he yeah. bothered with that, but he always wanted it for mum so, so he wouldn't have it, the car in the workshop. Yeah. But that's what I get from you. I, I get that, that you sense very early on through that wonderful training of yours, as you say, from the mail room, what a journey. And you, but you had the, I think what fascinates me through this is I grasp that you loved every element of that time, every moment, every, every part of that journey. And that's what's given you the richness and allowed you to be the success and, and have given uh, HSV such a fabulous um, platform to, to succeed in. Yeah, that's correct. And, and look, um, uh, one of the notes I, I sent on to George was that, you know, one of my best learnings was that at about 21, General Motors sent me to my first ever sales conference. And, and there were about 20 guys from sales department and service department and parts department from around Australia at this uh, sales conference we went to in Richmond. And the, the external sales trainer said to everybody at the start of the conference, he said, um, okay, I want to go around the room and ask everybody individually, I need a quick answer, what business are you in? And everyone said the car industry and or the, the parts industry, the service industry, et cetera. He said, you know what, you're all wrong. He said, never, ever, ever, ever forget this. And I haven't. He said, you are in the people business. And, and I, three years ago, I, 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 wrote, a, I wrote a book that, um, that I only did 150 copies on and sent it to friends, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that, that says, uh, 55 years in car heaven, Creno's insights into car people. And I hardly mentioned cars in that. I mentioned people. And I covered, I covered in at the 2,155 people I had dealings with and who I vividly remember working with right back at the start of 1962. And I only put their name in there on the basis that I could, if I was a gifted artist, I'd be able to draw their face or I'd describe their, 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 the way they walked and et cetera, et cetera. And, and that gave me great pleasure. And I, and I noted the year I first met them, et cetera. And from that, I also, which became quite contrary, I noted my, my top 100 people that, that, that I admired most out of the 2,155. But I learned a lot about the media game in that. 
because I also noted the top 10 jerks that I had to deal with over the course of 55 years. And, and, and they would have likewise considered me equally a jerk on the, other, on the other side. So the feeling would have been mutual. But all anyone ever wanted to know is who is your top 10 jerks? <laughs> but as I put it politely in the, in the book, as my mama would, mother would always say, she said, they weren't your cup of tea. So these, I described these 10 people weren't my, weren't my cup of tea, but it did teach me something about, uh, about media that, that, that the, the consumer really wants to know the, the, <laughs> the hard hitting stuff rather than, the, 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 than all the friendly stuff. Um, John Crennan is our special guest. We're gonna take a pause and come back with part two of, of an interview. We've been doing a bit of an origin story for John Crennan and discovered that he had a tenacious and, and wonderful gift and a work ethic that, that matched it and it allowed him to travel from the very early days at Holden right through to the, uh, to the present day. We'll find out what, what's next for the motorsport in this country and what John Crennan believes is the most exciting next chapter. John Crennan, thank you for joining us for part one. Thank you. Thank you.